I got to tell you a quick story. And so last week we started this series called My Big Fat Mouth. And it's all about words or the power of words or the words that we choose or use or whatever. But, but I, I remember several years ago I was in uh, the office of someone that I admire greatly. Um, I admire this person very much. They were uh, my pastor. They were my boss. They were, you know, and, and someone that I, I loved dearly. And I don't remember the conversation or how we got to the point where he said this phrase that I'm going to tell you. Uh, I, I don't think that this phrase was said um, in any way to kind of to hurt me or to be uh, negative or, or to be um, a jab or anything like that. I, I don't believe that. But it was. The words felt that way. I don't think his intentions were that way, but the words definitely felt that way. And uh, I, I remember I was much younger in ministry, and I, I had, it was like it was my dream to plant a church someday, like we've done, and and it was my dream to you know kind of uh, to 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 make a huge impact on the world. It was my dream to uh, kind of make a big impact on the way that we do church um, and the way that the American kind of the Western culture does church. It was like, so all of these things are in my young heart and I'm passionate about and, and excited about. And, and of course, you know, now I'm, I'm working in a church that is very similar to this ideology and, and just wants to love people and bring people into the kingdom and, and all of this. And, and I, and I find myself on this afternoon, I'm sitting in my pastor's office and he says to me, he says, you're not Stephen Furtick. Now, I, again, I don't know how he meant it. I don't know what his point was. I don't know what he was trying to accomplish in saying that. But what I can tell you is that um, uh, I can tell you how I heard it and how I felt as a result of someone telling me that. And, and, and here's what it was. It was this devastation of you're never going to be anybody. You're never going to make it. You'll never be good enough. You'll never measure up. You'll never be that great. You'll never be that caliber of an individual. You'll never be that successful. You'll never be, and it was just like this plethora of, of, of different things that kind of came alongside that very, very simple sentence. Now, my name is Nathan. I'm the lead pastor here at Ridgeline, and I'm I'm excited to continue this series that we started last week called uh, My Big Fat Mouth, and um, uh, today we're going to be talking about criticizing or criticism. Now, last week we talked about complaining, and if you missed it, feel free to get caught up on our central hub, RidgelineAsheville.com. And so today I want to talk about the problem of criticism. Now, here's what I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about uh, helpful coaching. I'm not talking about genuine, uh, someone who loves you, someone who loves you, their genuine desire to bring a blind spot to your attention or, or to help you improve in one area of your life. What I am talking about is, is I'm talking about the destructive, belittling, nagging, cruel words, phrases, sentences. Now, I know some of you are already thinking, oh, thank God, because <laughs> my spouse really needs to hear this. <laughs> or thank God, my mother-in-law, <laughs> I wish she was here, but uh, when this gets online, I'm going to be sending her a link, right? Or thank God, uh, my boss really, really needs to hear. Here's the problem with that thinking is that this series is called My Big Fat Mouth, not Their Big Fat Mouth. My. And the problem 
is that a critical spirit or being critical of, of others is difficult to see in the mirror. Being critical is difficult to see in the mirror. It's hard to see in ourselves. We hate it when others criticize us. We don't like to be criticized. Nobody loves being criticized. But, but we justify it when we criticize others. No one likes to be criticized and we hate. I can't believe the way that they talked to me. I can't believe the way they brought that to my attention. I can't believe the way. And, and then when we, we criticize others, no, we're justified. We're justified. I mean, they deserved it. I mean, just look at how they dress. I mean, they deserved it. Just look at uh, how, how the things that they post on their social media. Just look at the way that they drive. They deserved it. They deserved it. Just look at the way they spend their money. I thought they were in that financial uh, small group we have, and they're just out all the time spending and wasting money. Just look at the way they raise their kids. They deserved it. And some of us think the difference between coaching and criticizing is when it's, it's criticizing when someone else does it and it's coaching when you do it, right? <laughs> And that's how we face this thing. That's how we deal with this. But here's why we do it sometimes. We often criticize in others what we justify in ourselves. We often criticize in others what we justify in ourselves. And I can think of the most kind of obvious Christian example of this would just be pick any generic sin. You see somebody that you know who, who goes to church or that is, is a follower of Jesus and the way that they, they, uh, uh, there's some sort of sin or something you, you find out about or you catch it, you're critical, critical, critical. But you also have sin in your life. And we often, we criticize in others what we justify in ourselves. Well, no, 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 the reason why I yell at my kids The reason why I drive the way that I do, the reason why I get angry so often, the reason why I'm constantly late to work, the reason why I'm disrespectful to my parents, we justify and we justify and we justify. So real quick, I I just, before we get into some more scripture in a little while, I want to look at this popular verse that's followed by this much less popular verse. In fact, when I read this verse in a minute, uh, it's, it's, it's the Apostle Paul, he's quoting Jesus, and it's a pretty popular portion of Scripture, and, and, uh, and then he, the Apostle Paul continues writing into this next section, which you probably won't recognize unless you're really familiar with Galatians chapter 5, and here it is. Here's verse 14, and this is Paul writing, he says, for the whole law can be summed up in this one command, and then, then he quotes Jesus, love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law summed up in one command. Love your neighbor, right? This is the time Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, Jesus answered, they were trying to trick him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And then the second, it's just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. But here's the next verse. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, Watch out. Beware of destroying one another. Paul makes this connection between the way that you use your mouth and how you love your neighbor. The way that you use your mouth and how you love your neighbor. What if your mouth was destroying the intimacy in your marriage. For some of us, I bet that's the case. For me, that's been the case. What if it was our mouth, the way that we spoke to our spouse, that was destroying our levels of intimacy, greater levels of intimacy in our marriage? What if it it was the way that we used our mouth that, that that was placing a wall between us and our children? The way that we use our mouth is place, could be placing a wall between you and your kids. What if your mouth was placing distance between you and your closest friends? What, what, if, what if your mouth was damaging or is damaging your ability to witness? 
Now, here's a, here's a few more verses about our words. And here's a contrasting verse that, that uh, King Solomon writes. And, and uh, contrasting means he, he's going to talk about two very opposite things in the same verse. But you, you'll get the point. And he, here's what he says. He says, some people make cutting remarks. That's the first part. Some people make cutting remarks. You ever been around uh, uh, your grandmother and she says, your phone broke? You say, no, grandma, why? Because you never call me anymore. Like, boom, grandma burnt, right? Cutting remarks. <laughs> cutting remarks. Some people make cutting remarks, but here's the contrast. But the words of the wise bring healing. The words of the wise bring healing. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, here, here's what he says. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Okay, let me, let me just get a little, let's roll the, never mind. So people ask me all the time, or tell me, they like to tell me all the time that, you know, the Bible says, you, there's nowhere in the Bible that says you can't cuss. And that's how you know you're in the South, first of all. <laughs> it's, and second of all, technically, you are correct. You are correct. But I think there's plenty about our mouths or the way that we conduct our speech that would guide us in a direction that would be opposite of that type of language. And I believe that this is one of, one of those portions of Scripture. All right. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to whose needs? Their needs. That was good all at once. That was great. That it may benefit those who listen. The Apostle Paul teaches us that the way that we speak should, in, it should somewhat be determined by whom, to whom we are speaking. The way that we speak should somewhat be determined by to whom we speak. If someone is discouraged, then what, what is he saying? He's saying, speak to them in a way that is life-giving. If someone's experiencing loss, what, speak to them in a way that is life-giving. If someone's going through a difficult time, what do we do? We speak to them in a way that is life-giving. You don't know how your criticism will impact the rest of someone's life. And you don't know how your encouragement could impact the rest of someone's life. And so I'm sitting in my pastor's office, and he says that phrase. You're no Pastor Stephen Perkins who's an amazing man that I admire and honor, and the story is no disrespect to him. And I, I remember, I don't remember anything else that happened in that whole meeting. I, I do remember I got up and I left, and that began to just turn in my soul. Turn, turn, turn in my soul. And I think because I began to believe it maybe or whatever, the enemy you know, just comes in and rides on those negative words and just began to beat myself up. The enemy was beating me up. And I remember it was the next day. It was the next day. And no, nobody else knew this happened. Nobody, like, I, I didn't go and, and, you know, gossip about it or talk to somebody else about it or whatever. I just, I just kind of held that in real close, real deep, and I'm trying to figure out how to process what was spoken to me or what I felt like almost was spoken over me, you know. And, and, and I remember the next day, the Holy Spirit speaking to me these kind of what eventually were life-giving words. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Nathan, not in an audible voice. I don't, I've never heard the audible voice of God. And that sounds scary. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Nathan, you're no Stephen Verdict. And I went, no, I heard that yesterday. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I appreciate the second bout of encouragement. <laughs> he said, you're Nathan Chaudhry. 
You're exactly who I created you to be. You go be you. I don't remember the exact phrasing that I, I sensed from the Lord, but it was like this, like, of course you're not Stephen Furtick, dummy. Like, it was kind of like that. Like, like, you're you. Be you. Like, I created you to be you. I didn't create you to be a counterfeit of somebody else. I created you as an original to be yourself. And I just went, I remember my whole mentality changed about that conversation, about how I felt about that conversation. All of it was that, 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 that God designed me to be me and he didn't design me to be anyone else. And what, whether or not those words were meant to, to hurt me or put me in my place or just to, to be a contrast in some way or to make a point, I don't know. What I know is that I took them in a way that was hurtful and then the Holy Spirit came and spoke some life-giving words that were encouraging to me. And sometimes we speak words, or some words we take, and they're like life-taking. They suck the life out of us. We've all had conversations where you leave tired. They were not life-giving. They were confidence-shrinking, not confidence-building. And so here's where I want to spend the back half of this message is, is what kind of person do you want to be? What kind of person do you want to be? Because we have no idea how much criticism can hurt someone's heart. And we have no idea how God might use a single word of encouragement that we speak. And so who do we, what kind of person do we want to be? Here's the first type of person. First type of person is a, a fault finder. A fault finder will, will, will find what's wrong before we find what's right. Can find what's wrong, like, and you're good at it. We're good. If you're a fault finder, we can be so good at it. Sometimes I, I like you take pride in it, like, man, I can. And some of us, we, we do this only in a couple narrow areas of our life, and for the most part, we wouldn't consider ourselves to be a fault finder, but what we don't realize, because it's hard to see criticism in the mirror, a, a critical spirit in the mirror, is that we, maybe there's one, just one or two areas of our lives where, we're, where, where we are a fault finder. Oh, I mean, you can't believe my spouse, my husband, my wife. You know, and we criticize the dumbest things. Man, they, they can't chew right. Why can't they chew right? It's not that complicated. You just chew. Like, you close your mouth and you move your teeth. Like, it's not, and I don't understand what's wrong with him or her. Can't walk right. Look at the way that person walks. They walk so silly. What's wrong with them? They don't drive right, that's for sure. Can't drive. And they're always driving in the wrong lane. They're always going under this or over the, or they, I never feel safe when they drive. Can't breathe right? That is a real conversation we've had in our home. <laughs> Can't breathe? It's like, I have severe sleep apnea. Like, what? Like, I got to do what I got to do. I'm just trying to live through the night. Like, that's the best I get. We do it at work, maybe. Right? My boss can't run a meeting. What's wrong with him? Uh, friends, man, they kind of show, like I was on their Netflix the other day. You would not believe the trash that they wash. What is wrong with them? Or, or what they eat or where they vacation or all, all the different things that are, uh, and we just find like, it, it may not be everything in our life, but it may be just one specific thing, but we criticize and we criticize and we criticize and our words are not like the Apostle Paul encourages us to have a, this encouraging, up, uh, um, uplifting, life-giving type words. Words that fit the circumstance. Words that fit the person to whom we speak. And if you are a fault finder, you're a lot like the Pharisees, maybe. Constantly looking for the negative. Constantly looking for reasons to puff themselves up by putting others down. And the problem with this is that the Pharisees were a lot like the devil. In Revelation chapter 12, the devil's referred to as the accuser of those who belong to God. 
Some translations say the accuser of the brethren. Always looking for what's wrong. Always looking for what's wrong. Always looking for what's wrong. Looking to accuse, accuse, accuse. Looking to criticize, criticize, criticize. And, and what I find is a, a lot of it, we tend to criticize because of pride. We feel like we're better. We have to make that clear. We think that somehow uh, saying it out loud helps others know that we think we're better. Out of insecurity, oftentimes we criticize. But I, th- I think sometimes it's, it's, I have to be careful of this one specifically. I'll, I'll criticize out of a lack of understanding. You, you go somewhere, you meet somebody, and you go, why are they like this? Or why is it like this? This seems so dumb. And then you get to know their story. And you go, oh my gosh. If I've been through everything that person's been through, <laughs> I don't think I'd be half as put together as they are. We just don't understand. I find we, we criticize things that we don't understand. Here, here's, here's it. Like, it's... It's easy to be an amazing parent until you have kids, <laughs> right? It's easy to be a great parent. Like I, I, Chris and I, were, before we had kids, and we, we would talk about, um, we would talk about, you know, how amazing our kids are going to be, or how we're going to raise them, or how they're never going to throw a tantrum in a store or a restaurant or what, you know, like like you have those types of conversations, right? And then you get a two year old, it's a completely different thing. It's a completely different, like, I didn't realize that they would do this for no reason. Like, wh- why? Like, I, what, what can I give you? What do you want? You want, like, a play place? Do you want, like, a Porsche? Like, like what? Like, you can, you can have it. Just stop crying. It's easy <laughs> to criticize things we don't understand. Sometimes we criticize thinking, this makes us look smart. Or I've had to really deal with this one and cut this one out. This makes me look funny. <laughs> I try never to have a critical punchline. And let me tell you, there are a lot of them. They're my favorite punchline, you know? But I try never to speak a critical punchline. Try to make yourself look better. This makes me look better. If I say this, it makes me look smart. If I notice this, it makes me better. If I put in this little jab, everybody will laugh. But here's what happens. Instead, you end up looking insecure, mean-spirited, and sometimes not funny. It's just not funny. All right, here. Watch this. Ask yourself this question. Have you ever met a critical person that you've wanted to be like? Have you ever met a critical person that you've wanted to be like? Now, speaking of critical women, Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 21... (laughs) This is a joke, guys. There's a verse coming that has good context. All right. I didn't, I I said I shouldn't put this in here, and I put it in there, and then I said it, and that's the problem. All right. Proverbs 21 says this, Solomon says, it's better to live alone in a desert than with, with a quarrelsome, complaining wife. It's better to live alone in a desert than with a quarrelsome, complaining spouse will make some of us feel more comfortable. It's better to live alone in a desert than with a quarrelsome, complaining husband. This goes both ways. It's a principle that was written this way, but the principle goes both ways. principle goes both ways. I've never met a critical person that I wanted to be around. I've never met a critical person that I wanted to tether the rest of my life to. I've never met a critical person that I've wanted to work for, hang out with, spend time with, get mentored by. Like, I just, I've never done that. 
And so it's this question of, do you want to be a fault finder or do you want to be the second person, a hope dealer? A hope dealer, our words are life-giving regardless of the topic. Hope. Keeping it clear. See, I want to live in such a way that no matter the topic, you can't get me to criticize. You can't get me to say anything negative. It doesn't matter if we're talking about my favorite person in the world or my least favorite person in the world. And both are in this room. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter if, you know, I'm talking about something that I, I love, like my favorite sports team, the Pittsburgh Penguins, or my least favorite sports team who didn't make the playoffs, the Philadelphia Flyers. It doesn't matter if, doesn't matter what it is. What we're talking about, how upset I am, I want it to be the goal of my life that I live in such a way that no matter the topic that I just don't criticize. Watch this, Romans chapter 15. This is. I love this. It says, may the God of hope Fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I love this. Overflow. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is the Apostle Paul writing, and here, here's what I love, is that Paul was, was some, he was a hope dealer. Paul was somebody who, who uh, always wrote with a lot of hope and always shared uh, a lot of hope. And, and I imagine Paul being the type of guy that you couldn't be around Paul and have a bad day because he was just so hopeful. He was just so life-giving. And, and um, why do we say what we say? Now, watch. Why do we say... He was so hope-giving. But why, here it is, so that you may overflow with hope. Okay, I'm trying to make this point. Why do we say the things that we say? Why do we criticize? Why do we complain? Why do we say negative things? Why do those things come out of our mouth? The reason why they came out of our mouth is because They're in our heart. They come out of our mouths because they're in our heart. And so the Apostle Paul is writing in Romans 8, and he says, this is what I want for you, or Romans, whatever it was. This is what I want for you. I I, I want you to overflow with what? Hope. I want what comes out of your heart to be hope. When, When the things that bubble out of you, the words that you speak, the things that you say, those types of things, I want them to be filled with hope. And Paul was a hope dealer. Paul was someone who dealt with hope. And there's some statements that the Apostle Paul wrote all in one single chapter in Romans chapter 8. He says this. He says, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's such a hopeful statement. He says that the Holy Spirit helps us in our times of weakness. He says that Jesus is making intercession for us at the right hand of God the Father right now. And he says that you are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. That's what he says. And then a little later on, he says that neither neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor the powers nor any power, neither height nor depth or anything else in all of creation can separate us from the love of Jesus, from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the type of hope that Paul was dealing with. That's the type of hope that was bubbling out of him. And so, we want to be a fault finder or a hope dealer. The Pharisees were fault finders. The devil, the accuser of the brother, fault finder. But Jesus, Jesus is full of hope. 
Throughout scripture, we see things about Jesus like that he is uh, the bread of life or living water or good shepherd or he's the door, the living vine, he's the gate, he's the king of kings and the lord of lords and the alpha and the omega. He's, he's all of those things. But did you know that in 1 Timothy chapter 1, it refers to Jesus Christ as our hope. And in Titus chapter 2, it refers to Jesus as our the blessed hope. And 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, it refers to Jesus as the living hope. The living hope. Jesus. It's our hope. There was this, there was this uh, lady caught in adultery. The religious leaders actually catch her in the very act. Catch her in adultery. And they bring her to Jesus. They, they want to know what Jesus is going to say, whether or not he's going to keep the law or not. And the law was that you would stone her for being caught in the act of adultery. And so they bring her before Jesus and they say, Jesus, we caught this woman in adultery. Jesus doesn't say stone her. Instead, what he does is he begins to uh, get down in the, in the dirt and he begins to write some things. We don't know what he wrote. One by one, all of her accusers begin to walk away. There's a lot of speculation about what Jesus wrote. I, I don't know how much bearing it has on the story. But they all walk away. And then it's just Jesus and this lady, caught in the very act. If she was caught in the very act, that means there would have been two people. They only brought one before Jesus. <laughs> like, where's the man? Jesus doesn't stone her or accuse her. See, the Pharisees, they pointed to her sin. Jesus says, your sins have been forgiven. Now go and sin no more. Pharisees were fault finders. Jesus was a hope dealer. Jesus dealt hope. Jesus asked her, at one point, he, he asked her, where are your accusers now? In other words, where, where are all the fault finders? They're all gone. Go and sin no more. See, the, the Pharisees would point out her sin. Jesus would address the sin and give her hope. Jesus addressed the sin and gave her hope. What do you want to be? What do you want to be? You want to be a fault finder who belittles, demeans, tear da tears down? Or do you want to be a hope dealer? that lifts, strengthens, and encourages. About the same time, maybe it was a little bit after that first story where I was sitting in my pastor's office. I, I, I was at uh, the ARC conference in Birmingham, Alabama, which is, we're, we're an ARC church, and, and so our um, our fellowship or whatever has, has conferences every year. And so I was at the art conference, you know, four or five, 6,000 people, whatever it is. I can't remember how big, big the place is, but like thousands of people. The, the first ARC church plant, so ARC church plant number one, like we're 575-ish or something like that. But church plant number one is um, by a pastor named Chris Hodges. And uh, Chris Hodges uh, is, runs uh, a small church of about uh, 40,000 on a weekend. And so, uh, you know, it's safe to say he's killing it. Like, like he's doing a good job at what he does. Um, and so I think this year, our, uh, the, our conference was at his place, was at his church. And, um, and he's such a just nice guy, genuine, loves Jesus, loves his city, loves the ark. He invests a lot into our 
um, church planning organization and all that. Incredible stand-up guy. Like the type of guy you say, man, that guy can be my pastor any day of the week. And I remember I had a brief opportunity. I, again, I was with our pastor from Destin, back home in Destin, Florida. And, um, or that's where Crystal's home is. But, uh, and we, so we were, all of us as a staff, we were up in Birmingham at, at our conference. And I remember I was with Eric, Pastor Eric and we were walking around through the place and, and we, he knows a little bit, he knows Pastor Chris Hodges, the Chris Hodges, our church plan number one, Chris Hodges, you know. And so he said, hey, come on, I'll introduce you. I thought, oh, okay, this would be fun. I'm going to meet Chris Hodges. I wonder what this is going to be like, you know. It's that whole thing, like, don't meet your heroes kind of thing, you know. And I, I remember... Uh, Eric and Chris, who, you know, kind of knew each other, um, they, they briefly spoke, and, and then he introduced me to Pastor Chris. And, and then Pastor Eric said, basically, Nathan is killing it at his job. I was a campus pastor, and this is an unheard of kind of scenario. Uh, there's lots of things that play into this, so just, you know, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back here, but I, I ran, I was a campus pastor who ran a campus in a multi-site church, uh, and my campus was actually bigger than the main campus. Again, a lot of things going on and dynamics for that and reasons for that and whatever. It's, you know, but, but that's, that's how it was. And so Pastor Eric brings that up. He's killing it. He's one of our campus pastors. Actually, his campus, bigger than the main campus. And I remember Pastor Chris Hodges, he looked me in my eyes, he stuck at his hand and shook my hand. And he said, I'm proud of you, Nathan. And that, to this day, is the only sentence that Chris Hodges has ever spoken to me. I've never met him, I didn't meet him before, and I've never met him since. He said, I'm proud of you, Nathan. And I carry those words around with me. And I don't tell this story often. It's not like I go around bragging, hey, by the way, Chris Hodges is proud of me. You know, like, like most people would be like, who? You know, like I get that. But I carry those words. Those words meant a lot to me that my pastor would speak so highly of me to someone with such influence and that somebody with such influence would speak so honorably to me as well. It meant a lot. Carries a lot of weight for me. That one sentence from Pastor Chris Hodges. And here's my point. There's probably lots of negative things that my pastor could have said about me to Chris Hodges. Hey, he's a decent campus pastor, but man, his organizational skills. <laughs> you know, there's probably a lot of those. See, your, your child may not be the most tidy child, but you can still say, man, I just, I just want you to know I love how compassionate and thoughtful you are. And, and your roommate may, may eat all the food and wear your clothes, uh, but yeah, hey, I just want you to know I think you're such a loyal and your wife may not be the most organized person. And uh, hey, I, I just want you to know that I think you're an amazing mother. Or your, your husband may not win yard of the month from HOA, uh, but you, it's okay to go, hey, when you're out there mowing the lawn in your high socks, you know, like you look so good. It's okay. Why am I passionate about this? Here's why. It's because I've been on both ends. I've been on the receiving end of both sides. I've been on the receiving end of when somebody says something that just devastates your soul. I've been on the receiving end of when somebody says something that's just so life-giving. It feels like you're, you're, you got, it gives you energy and I've also, uh, like all of us, right, like we, we've all been on both sides of this. And we, like we, I've been on the other end of this 
where, where it's like, you know, I say a word and I, I know it's encouraging and I mean it to be encouraging and that person just looks at you like, oh my gosh, that's like water for my soul. Thank you so much for saying that. Uh, that's so encouraging. I'm glad that we have a relationship or, or whatever it is. But then I've, I've also said some things that, that it's been like you, you, you say it and, and you know you shouldn't have said it and, and then you look in your daughter's eyes or, 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 or your spouse's face or whatever and you just see the devil station and the hurts I've been on both sides and what I'd say is that we have no idea how a single word of criticism can pierce or kill or destroy someone's soul we have no idea how a word of encouragement can give life and change someone's destiny I don't think Pastor Chris Hodges would would have thought that day when he said, hey, Nathan, I'm proud of you, that eight years later, I'd still be telling this story. (laughs) He has no idea the impact. And so I want us to be the type of church. I want to lead a church full of hope dealers full of people who are so overflowing with hope that it just automatically comes out their mouth. It just comes out their mouth in every situation. It's not, it's not criticism. It's not complaining. It's not whining. It's not backbite. It's, it's, none of the, it's hope. It's hope. It's, it's Jesus. It's life. It's, it's, it's something that's going to be a blessing, not something that's going to tear down. I want to lead a church that's full of hope dealers. We don't criticize. We speak life. We deal only in hope. 2 Corinthians 13, Apostle Paul, he finishes up this uh, letter to the church in Corinth and he says, I I close my letter with these last words. Be joyful, grow in maturity, encourage each other, live in harmony and peace. Then the God of love and peace will be with you. It's this encouragement that we mature and that we speak in ways hopeful and honoring and that give life that we would be hope dealers, not fault finders. Let's stand.